Hey, John Strohmeyer here with Strohmeyer Law. Today we're going to be talking about what President Biden has proposed in his tax proposals for the next tax year. So we're going to go through what I saw as some of the highlights. As we get started, remember my crystal ball isn't very good. Who knows what will happen? Also, remember, while I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. So even though I'll talk about some of the things that may work or what sort of planning you should consider, remember to talk to somebody who you are actually paying to advise you. Don't just trust some random talking head on YouTube for your tax planning advice. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and start counting down on what is in this new proposal. Well, the first thing to look at is President Biden has proposed increasing the top marginal tax income rate for high income taxpayers. Now, the good news is most of us aren't going to see this. The bad news is some of us will. Now, currently the top income tax rate is 37% and is scheduled to revert to 39.6% in 2026. Remember, we've got a lot of tax provisions that are going to expire in 2026. The last version of the major tax bill, 2017, under President Trump, they increased uh, some tax exemptions, so the unified credit went way up, the tax rates came down, there was some simplification, and some other things went away. Well, January 1, 2026, a lot of that reverts, and here this top marginal tax rate is one of the things that will be going back. So. Presently, the top rate of 37% applies to single people with income more than $539,900. If you're married filing a joint return, then you have to hit $647,850 of joint income before you hit that top rate. Now, the proposal from President Biden is that they're going to bring that top rate back up to 39.6% starting in 2023. So that means this year current 2023, they would start applying it for this year when you file your returns in 2024. Now, this would also apply to taxable income over $400,000 for a single person or $450,000 for a married couple that is filing jointly. That amount would be indexed for inflation starting after 2024. So you'd have $400,000 for a single person in 2023, you'd have 400,000 in 2024, then we'd hit an inflation adjustment starting in 2025, if this were to pass. Now, I don't think there's much chance of this or any of the other things we're going to talk about passing. But it is important to see where they think they can even get any sort of traction. Here we are, we're proposing this, or the, the administration has proposed this, I don't think there's any real chance that we're going to see this either this year or next year. This year, look, the Republican Congress, uh, House of Representatives just doesn't want to pass anything that would raise taxes. Next year, it's an election year. You wouldn't get any major legislation like that out anyway. So we're looking at possibly 2025 before we'd see anything like this even reasonably coming to pass. Now, when we start looking at the next item up, this is also the baseline tax rate. This is going to be your tax rate on qualified dividends and long-term capital gains. Now, currently, the top tax rate on qualified dividends and long-term capital gains is 20%. This is you know, legislative grace. This is tax planning opportunities. Instead of that 37% or 39.6%, gets cut down to 20%. Why? Generally, dividends and long-term capital gains are things that have been earned over multiple years. You know, the, the gain has gone up year over year, but you only recognize it in a particular year. So that's part of the reason. It also is meant to be tax policy that encourages this sort of income. Now, what have they proposed? Well, the administration has proposed taxing qualified dividends and long-term capital gains. So again, capital gains for more than a year at ordinary income rates with a top rate of 37% or 39.6% if they get that top rate bump for taxpayers with income over a million dollars, but only to the extent that their income exceeds $1 million. Uh, and that's indexed for inflation after 2024. Essentially what this is doing is just saying you get the 20% rate up to a certain amount. And then if you're over that, you know, if you're making too much money, 
well, then you get hit with the higher taxes there. So this would be, uh, in effect, or the proposal here would make this effective after the date of enactment. So again, there's kind of some rush of, well, what if they do this? And the reality is they're probably not, but the idea is it wouldn't affect anything that happens before that. So, you know, if it gets down the line, sure, you might see some people trying to squeeze in dividends or making some sales before everything gets finalized. Again, I don't think there's much of a chance of happening. But what you're going to see throughout this, we're going to see a lot of an enacted or effective after date of enactment. I want to keep that in mind when we get to the end. Next topic, getting into more estate planning items, transfers of appreciated property. Now, basis is something that comes up a lot. When you sell property, if you buy a stock at $10 and you sell it for $100, you're only taxed on your gain of 90 So that's the 100 selling price, the amount received, less the basis of 10 equals 90 Tax rates applied to that, 20%, 15%, whatever that rate is. So you're not paying tax on the return on your investment. Well, again, under current law, if you give something to someone else, then they take what is known as a carryover basis for those gifts. And if someone receives something from you when you pass away, their basis is actually stepped up or down to the fair market value on the date of death. So one example, if you bought stock at $10, it's gone up to $100, and you give it to somebody before you die, they will take that $10 basis with it when they receive it. But if you die owning that $10 stock, with uh, $10 basis stock, and you leave it to someone under your will or trust agreement and they then receive it after you've passed well it's stepped up to that hundred dollars so they're going to escape taxation on that ninety dollars of gain that was there moments before you passed away well the proposal is now that they're going to treat these transfers of appreciated property by gift or on death as realization events so this capital gains tax at death would be deductible against the estate tax this is actually a pretty major change. And this is going to really kind of unwind or roll back on what we had for the estate tax. Now, for years, when the estate tax was much lower, when the credit and unified credit amount was so much lower, well, sure, you were effectively paying one tax on it when things, when you when you passed. You'd get the step up in basis, but you'd already paid estate tax. So, you know, you're kind of shifting which tax you're paying. What this is now saying is we're going to treat a gift as a realization event. So if you have that $90 tax or $90 of gain when you give it away at a 20% tax rate, well, you're giving $100 worth of value, but somebody's going to have to cut a check for 20% of that $90 gain or about $18. Where that comes from, you know, obviously, who knows? We're going to have to see this come through. This is one where I'm saying, you know, just I don't think this is really going to happen. This one seems way too much. Now, they were going to, there's a proposal as well that assets in trust or in a partnership be marked to market for, you know, every 90 years starting in January 1, 1942, so that the first possible recognition event would be in December 31, 2032. It's important to note this is similar to what they have in Canada. Every few decades, I can't remember if it's 20 or 30 years or 25, it's something like that, assets in a trust or a partnership have to have their gains recognized. Now, when they're doing this, they don't want any partial value discounts. Uh, it really is, again, just trying to recognize gain, trying to stop people from deferring payment of tax. Uh, there would be some exceptions under this. So a transfer to a U.S. spouse would not be a realization event, but would still have that carryover basis. Transfers to a charity would still remain non-taxable. Transfers to any sort of split interest trust, so a charitable lead trust or a charitable remainder trust, would be taxable to the extent of the value of uh except to the extent of what the charity might receive. So if you're going to put stuff in a charitable lead or charitable remainder trust, there would be some partial recognition of that gain to the extent that the charity is not going to get it. So again, this is a proposal. 
just thinking through, well, it's easy to put these words down, but the administration and calculations on this seem a little cumbersome, to put it mildly. Now, uh, what else would they be thinking about? Exclusions, there's an exclusion for the gain and sale of principal residence. We already have this, where it's $250,000 gain can be excluded, doubled up for a married couple filing jointly. Uh, the Section 1202 ex exclusion for small business stock still is going to apply. And there would also be a $5 million per person exclusion on property transferred by gift or at death indexed for inflation from 2023. So instead of just the unified credit, we also have some exemptions that we can start throwing around. So it's another item, another tax item that they'd want us to start tracking for people. Uh, you know, one more thing, why not? Um, and, you know, oh, well, whatever you don't use, then you can port that between spouses like you would with the unused uh, credit amount. Now, again, this is, I think, one of the less likely things to change. It's just upending a certain amount of stability that's been in the transfer tax system for years. I'm not saying it'll never happen, but I really don't see this happening in the next two years. Something like this... You know, we're, we're going to need super majorities of Democrats in both houses that really want to add another layer of tax. It is going to add complexity for everybody else because they're going to have to be tracking these numbers. I mean, we'll see. Going to the next topic. A minimum tax on our wealthiest taxpayers. Well, right now, capital gains and certain dividends one of the benefits they have is these are gains that aren't taxable until they are realized and recognized. Think about it this way. If your $10 stock in Exxon has gone up to 100, if you don't want to pay tax on that, you don't have to pay tax on it until you're ready to actually sell it and recognize that gain of $90. Now, the proposal is imposing a minimum 25% tax on the total income, including unrealized capital gains, which is a bigger thing than you may think, on taxpayers with wealth over $100 million. Now, already, there are just so many wiggle bits of wiggle room and added complexity for people. You know, one, how do you know when you have more than $100 million? You know, if you're way over, that's one thing. If you're way under, that's another. But there's going to be room to game the system. How are we going to plan around? How do you know if you have hundred million dollars what if you have a hundred million and one dollar what if the appraisals come back like are you going to have to do appraisals every year the complexity on this is going to be pretty punishing now for the people who have a hundred million dollars or they're close i can already hear well you know golly boohoo sure this but this is going to be something that comes up it's going to affect people who have like, these closely held businesses. You know, unrealized capital gains. If you own a, a business and it's closely held, forcing them to trigger you know, potentially all of the gain on everything in that business could force them to have to sell that company. Again, this is something I don't think is going to happen. This is just kind of wildly out of line with what we've been doing and what we've been set up for. Uh, they're saying the first... The tax for the first year could be paid in nine equal annual installments, and the tax for subsequent years could be paid in five equal annual installments. This would start in 2024. Again, you're talking about forcing, you know, forcing people to liquidate a lot of what they have so that they can pay tax on things that previously would have gone untaxed until people wanted to. It's an attempt to goose revenue out of a system that, you know, has been set up on. You get to pick when you do this. So it's it's kind of a major change that, again, just see as pipe dream, not realistic. Doesn't mean they don't put it down. Just means that's where it is. Next, looking back at our estate planning, grantor retained annuity trusts. So this is something where it is a split interest trust. You put assets in into a trust, you as the grantor of that trust get a or get an annuity stream that you're retaining for a number of years, and then the remainder of that goes on to somebody else. So you as a grantor are retaining an annuity stream in a trust after a number of years or after you have passed away that is gifted at a discounted rate 
to somebody else. The reason it is discounted, well, assets are coming back to you, so you're not really making a gift to somebody else. If you put $100 in, get a dollar back every year, and then whatever's left at the end of the term or at the end of your life goes to somebody else, have you really given them $100? No, you've taken some income stream back. There are calculations that go along with this. Don't want to get into those today, but the thing to think about is it's a way of making discounted gifts and you're betting that the assets, you know, the, the reason to do this, you're betting that the assets that are going into the trust are going to appreciate sufficiently to where you can keep an income stream, but there's also something of value left to transfer to somebody else. Well, the administration has proposed that grants are going to be required to have a minimum term of 10 years and that the maximum term is going to be equal to the life of the, the annuitant, so the grantor, plus 10 years. Again, we don't want what they don't want are short rolling grats. They're trying to bring back that planning policy. What they want to do is just say, look, this is what's available for you and kind of rein in what's being due on that. They also want the remainder interest, so the amount that's being gifted, must have a value at least equal to the greater of either 25% of the value contributed to the grant or $500,000, but certainly not more than the value of the assets contributed. Again, the idea is if you're making a gift, it can't be zeroed out. What, again, what people are doing is trying rolling grats. It's a strategy where, you know, you, every year you're putting assets in a grat, hoping that, well, look, maybe you'll hit it big one year and a lot of assets will get moved out at a low tax cost. What this is really proposing to do is kind of rein that in. This is one where this is a more advanced planning technique. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some raining in on grants eventually. Now, this, again, effective upon enactment. So if you were thinking about a grant, this is something to start thinking about maybe moving forward on. Again, I don't think there's any likelihood this really goes through in the next year and a half, but it doesn't mean they're not coming for it. This has been a consistent uh, proposal. Eventually, I think those are going to get reined in. So there's an option. More likely, again, not effective until enactment. The next thing, going back to an income tax topic, we've got grantor trusts. Now, currently, grantor trust rules allow for a different treatment of the income taxation of income in a trust. Unlike a corporation where you have two layers of tax, the corporation pays tax, then when there are dividends paid out, the shareholder is also going to pay tax on that as well, two layers of tax. When you have a partnership, so this could be something like a you know, limited liability partnership or a limited liability company, LLC. If you have multiple members or multiple partners, they're taxed as a partnership. The entity doesn't pay tax. It just collects all that tax information and issues schedule K, schedules K-1 to the partners or the members so that they can report and pay tax at their individual rates. S corporations are a different thing we can have a different chat about that, but it gets it's kind of a blending of corporation tax rules and partnership tax rules. Well, a trust traditionally has one layer of tax that's allocated between the trustee and the beneficiary. So as the trustee receives income, they're responsible for the tax. There's a calculation called distributable net income, DNI, to the extent that DNI is kicked out or distributed to the beneficiary, the beneficiary pays tax on it. So the tax is only assessed once, either the trustee or the beneficiary. Grantor trusts have inserted a third person in there. Years ago, trust tax rates were much lower than individuals. So people would put income generating assets inside of a trust, have the trust pay lower income tax, and then the income would basically sit in there and avoid the high individual income tax rates. What Congress did was say, look, for certain trusts, we're going to make the grantor responsible for the tax. We're going to let them pay at their individual rates so they can't get a tax benefit from putting assets in trust. This is kind of flipped. Now we have trust income tax rates that hit that top 37% rate at about $12,000 worth of income every year instead of the 450 to 600,000 whatever it is for individuals the benefit is put assets in trust but have the grantor pay their pay the income tax at their rate 
what then happens is the grantor is paying that tax. It's their obligation, but the assets inside the trust aren't being subjected to income tax. They're still paying, income tax is still being paid on the assets inside of that, but the grantor is paying it, not the trustee. So we had this ability to create a trust that wasn't subject or wasn't going to be includable in estate gift tax purposes anymore. You'd made a completed gift. Then someone else was paying the income tax. Well, the administration has proposed that if a tr taxpayer creates a grantor trust that's not fully revocable, then sales between the grantor and that trust would be taxable, uh, effective on sales after the date of enactment. So again, you can still get the benefit of uh, paying the tax, but what they're also going to do is make the payment of that income tax treated as another taxable gift, effective for trust created on or after the date of enactment. Again, what they're doing is trying to claw back some of the benefits of this. Really, it's almost saying, well, if you want this benefit, sure, you can pay the tax, but it's going to be treated as an additional taxable gift to the trust. This is a maybe. I'd put this in the kind of moderately likely in the next 10-ish years, but who really knows? So, you know, grantor trust, it's been a powerful tool for us to allow additional gifts to be made by paying income tax due. Another thing to think about is, well, what if you just invest in things that don't generate income tax? That's an option. Going to our next topic, consistent valuation of promissory notes. Again, this is something where the valuation rules may allow some whipsawing. Again, the administration has proposed requiring certain discount rates for the note uh, for estate and gift tax purposes be limited to the greater of the interest rate on the note or the applicable or the AFR applicable federal rate uh, for the remaining term of the note. This gets a little complicated, but again, it's one more thing that we look at as an option. Getting to the next topic, what we're then thinking about is valuation discounts. When you make a gift into a trust, when you make a gift for state for gift tax purposes, when you hold on to something at your death, and it, we're valuing it for state tax purposes, you can take advantage of discounts like lack of control, lack of marketability when transferring those closely held business interests. You know, kind of mark in. Well, look, it's a million dollar business. I own ten percent of it. I couldn't have controlled it. If I wanted to go sell it, who's going to buy a ten percent closely held interest? You know, instead of it being worth a hundred thousand dollars, maybe it's worth. Seven hundred, or you know, ten thousand dollars. It's worth like seven or eight thousand. Kind of taking a discount on what that is. Now, what has been proposed is requiring that any sort of infra, intra family transfers of these partial interests, uh, you've got the if the family owns at least twenty five percent, then of that interest, then the valuation is going to be based on 25% of the collective fair market value. So if you're taking something where you own 100% and you give 1% here and there, it's going to be 1% of the 100%, not 1% with all these other discounts worked in. If it's an interest in a trader business, passive assets had to be will have to be valued separately from the trader business assets. So you can't jam a bunch of cash in there or stock and take a discount on that. Now, this is going to, under the proposal, be applicable to valuations after the date of enactment. Again, they're getting to things that really, you know, are seen as abusive. Like, how can you take a value or a discount on the value of stock just because you put it in an LLC or you put it in a family controlled entity. This again, it may not be coming in the next 18 months, but given a long enough timeline, I think this one is going to be coming in eventually. So next, what do we have up? Uh, changes to administration of trusts and estates. This really gets more into internal workings for the IRS. They want to make it a little easier for people to deal with the IRS if they don't happen to be appointed as the executor. Again, administrative rules, not much for us to deal with there. And finally, uh, what we've got are gift tax annual exclusions and crummy powers. You've probably heard you can give 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, now currently $17,000 per year to people. What the proposal is, is yes, you can still give up to $17,000 per person away to as many people as you want, 
but you're going to be limited to $50,000 of annual exclusion gifts. So this means you can give five $10,000 gifts, 10 $5,000 gifts, two $17,000 and one $16,000 gifts. That will work. Those annual exclusions will work until you hit $50,000 maximum per year. After that, you're you're no longer going to have that annual exclusion. This this is something I'm not so sure about. Again, I think there's going to be enough pushback. This is a pretty good long-term planning technique that people like. I would be surprised if that goes through. When it comes to crummy powers, this is the ability to put assets into a trust and have a present interest long enough to allow that to qualify for a gift tax exclusion when cash is being put into a gifting trust. Next topic. Limiting the duration of the GST exemption again. Thinking about the generation skipping transfer tax, this is a tax where we do want, or the point is to back up the gift and estate tax system so that people can't just give to their grandkids. Well, once it goes in trust, the proposal here would basically say, we're going to limit that. It's not forever. It really is. At a certain point, we're going to come back and reapply GST. Next topic is... Net investment income tax, uh, again, income tax that's out there, they're going to try and uh, up the rate, again, effective beginning in 2023. Who knows if this actually comes through? Same with the Medicare tax rate for high income taxpayers, raising it on the high income earners to try and goose more revenue there. And, you know, everybody's favorite, we've been talking about this since I've been in school, taxing carried interests as ordinary income. It's trying to get the, you know, hedge fund folks who can take advantage of carried interest as capital gains when really it's their normal job, this is what they do all day, tax that as ordinary income instead of capital gains. Repeal 1031, again, this is seen as abusive, it's a real estate transaction where you can swap one kind of real estate for another and defer the gain. Again, I, the real estate lobby is pretty powerful. I'd be surprised if that actually comes out. And finally, uh, limiting your rollovers and conversions. This is something where you can do what are called backdoor Roths. They're going to try and close that availability to make contributions to people who are not otherwise eligible to make contributions to Roths. So with that, we're going to kind of close it down. This has been a good number of the topics that are out there. You know, for most of them, what you didn't see, we didn't see the credit amount coming down. They know that's going to be showing up eventually. Most of these, the estate and gift ones, they're not trying to retroactively make these applicable. They're just saying when it gets passed, that's when it'll be effective. I think that trend will continue. The people who are doomsaying over oh my gosh, this is going to be something that you have to get it done now because they can make it retroactive for a state and gift. I just don't think that's realistic. But I've been John Strohmeyer. We will be back in two weeks with another live stream to cover topics. If you've got questions, please let us know. We've got plenty of other videos. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you next time.